Okay, good morning. My name's uh, Nick Wright. I work at um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab at NERSC, which is the National Energy Supercomputing Center. So for those of you don't, that don't know, NERSC is the Mission High Performance Computing Center for the Department of Energy. So what that means is that um, if you have a research project that is of interest to the Office of Science and you're funded by the Office of Science to do uh, chemistry or physics and you need computing, uh, NERSC is the place that will provide uh, computing resources for you. And those basically fall into two categories. We have large numbers of simulations at scale, as well as people doing increasingly more and more uh, analysis of observational and experimental facilities. So this example you see up on the screen here, this is the ALS, the Advanced Light Source, the synchrotron at Berkeley. And what you're seeing, whereas it used to be 15 years ago, there was an end station at the end of a beam line with a PCI card in. Uh, that end station is now moving into the supercomputer. So that's changing the way we are uh, using the supercomputers today. And we're uh, also thinking about how you blend that kind of a workload with the simulation workload. So like Dan, um, NERSC has a large number of users. It maybe has 700 codes rather than 4,000, but we still serve a, a broad swath of um, different applications across many different domains. So NERSC overall has a dual mission. Uh, our role is, is to work with uh, computing companies to try and deploy state-of-the-art supercomputers, and at the same time to provide these computing resources in order to advance the scientific goals of our users. So we do um, talk to the vendors a lot and try and ensure that we're uh, not just deploying the greatest, shiniest thing with the largest possible numbers that none of our users can use. At the same time, um, we also try and push our users forward. Um, this is our NERSC roadmap. So the machine I'm going to talk about today is Palmata, which is NERSC 9, which will be delivered next year. Um, and one of the things we try and do when we deploy our machines is think about what's coming further down the road. So you've heard already uh, about Exascale, and you'll be hearing more and more about the Beyond Moore's machines, which will probably show up in the 25, 26, 27, 28 timeframe. So one of the things we try and think about is uh, how we can deploy technologies in the machines that will encourage our users to modify their codes and start using new and innovative technologies that will actually benefit them rather than just continually running the same old code on the same old CPUs. Because at some point, as you all know, they're just going to run out of performance and they're not going to get anywhere. So this is a variation of the slide that Laurie showed earlier. This just shows you where Palmata fits in the overall DOE roadmap. Um, Palmata is a pre scale machine and it will be delivered, as I said, next year. So this is a high-level sketch of the overall Palmata machine. We will have uh, two different kinds of nodes on the machine. We will have some CPU-only nodes with AMD CPUs. We will have some GPU-accelerated nodes with AMD CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, we will also have a Cray Slingshot Interconnect and a Luster or Flash file system. And like Dan mentioned earlier, we're also ha uh, on his machine, we also have a large number of uh, login nodes and workflow nodes and service nodes sitting at the front of the machine. And one of the reasons why is that uh, kind of experimental workload that I talked about earlier, they really require databases and other such services to link into the supercomputer uh, to control the flow of the data and the kind of work that's being done. So it's gone from what it used to be 10 years ago with just 10 login nodes. You need a much richer ecosystem sitting out in the front of the machine to orchestrate all these services today. So this is a pie chart of um, what applications are running on the NERSC machine, uh, broken down by CPU time. So although we do have 600 applications, three, just three applications take up one quarter of the, of the cycles used on the machine, 10 take up more than half, and 30 take up more than 75%. So what that means is that uh, workload has a very high uh, peak at the beginning and then a very, very long tail. So as I mentioned earlier, we need to think about how we try and satisfy both these groups of users, the ones that use a substantial amount of time, as well as the ones that are up here in the top left in the other section, 
uh, which uh, much, much smaller users of the machine overall. So one of the things we did when we were thinking about how we would deploy uh, GPUs in order to benefit the users of uh, NERSC was to analyze how many of the users and how many of the applications could use GPUs today or there was some prior art in the literature or some application that um, was very, used a very similar algorithm to the application that uh, was of uh, interest to us to also use GPUs. And so this is the analysis that was done at NERSC where we analyzed the um, different kinds of applications to see which ones had uh, experience and um, but had versions ready to, to leverage GPUs already. What we actually found was, um, it, we found roughly half of the total number of hours used at NERSC today has uh, the ability to use GPUs, which was um, a nice thing to see um, and really a testament to the amount of work that NVIDIA uh, uh, and uh, IBM and others have done uh, with the community working towards using uh, GPU acceleration. So that gave us an idea um, that we could do a substantial deployment of GPUs at NERSC, but we wouldn't necessarily want the whole machine to be GPU uh, enabled, as I showed you earlier. So this is just a little bit about what the GPU nodes themselves look like. Um, they are going to have four uh, NVIDIA GPUs, and they're going to be um, Volta next. So that's the next one on the roadmap after the current one of today of Volta. So, uh, and similar to Dan, I'm not allowed to say anything about any numbers or, or uh, anything. But anyway, that's the specifications of Volta. You can all imagine that the specifications of the one after Volta will be bigger, better, and higher numbers than the ones that are written up there. Um, the machine will have a unified virtual memory, so you will be able to access a page of memory on the CPU and have it um, from the GPU and vice versa. Overall, the GPU partition will be roughly two to three times the performance of, uh, of our Cori machine today. As I mentioned, we'll also have uh, AMD CPU-based nodes. Um, these are based on AMD ROM process, uh, sorry, excuse me, AMD Milan processor, which is the one after ROM on the AMD roadmap. Um, these are the public specs of the AMD ROM up there. As you, again, as you can imagine, AMD Milan is gonna be a little bit different and a little bit better than that. So in order to get uh, all of those users up and running on the GPUs, we have something at NERSC called the NERSC Exascale Science Application Program. And the idea of that is to work with the users to help them tune their applications and get them up and running on the GPU. So we spent a large amount of time on our Curry machine, which was a Knight's Landing-based machine, uh, with a similar kind of program to this, um, where we uh, help the users vectorize their code, we help them add OpenMP to their code, we help them get uh, up and running on the KNLs. And what we found overall was that, um, as uh, other people at other centers have found, is as well as getting the codes on average three to four times faster than they were before they started running on the KNLs, they also helped the user's applications running on the traditional CPUs, and they got more than a factor of two performance increase running on the traditional CPUs through this kind of work. So this is the kind of thing that, um, as Laurie was talking about earlier, ECP is doing as well, modernizing the applications and getting, and thinking about changing the algorithms and changing um, the data structures and things like that in order that you can actually exploit the capabilities of modern uh, CPUs and GPUs and other such, uh, uh, architectural features. <coughs> so next thing I wanted to mention was um, the Cray Slingshot Network. Um, so there's again not a lot I can say that's not under NDA, but if you want to know more under NDA, Larry and John are sitting over there from Cray, give us a wave. They will tell you much more uh, at the break if you're interested. Um, so the Cray Slingshot Network was developed, uh, co-developed under the Path Forward program that Laurie talked about earlier. Um, which was funded by the DOE. So it's a next generation high performance computing HPC network. Um, 
It has, uh, as you may expect, la low latency and high bandwidth. It also has a nice uh, set of MPI performance enhancements. So what that means is that uh, it will run applications at scale in the same way that a Cray Ares uh, network does today. Um, one of the things that always uh, has been driving uh, users crazy on HPC machines over the last 10 years has really been performance variability. So this is what this plot at the top right here is showing you. Um, this is just running the same application, Milk, which is a quantum chromodynamics application, over and over again on the same machine. And what you see is that um, sometimes when you run it, uh, it runs more than three times slower than it does most of the time. And one of the reasons why is that, um, especially on Dragonfly networks, uh, but also on factory networks, there's just congestion on the network. The, what the other user is doing is getting in the way of what it is that you're doing. And so uh, after us telling Cray for many years, this is something we would like them to address in the Slingshot network. Uh, I'm really excited to say that there will be a lot of sophisticated congestion control and adaptive routing mechanisms to actually deal with this. So this is a really good thing for, for the, uh, our users and for the uh, community overall. The second cool thing about the Slingshot network is that it is Ethernet compatible. Um, so what that means is that if you really want to, you can just uh, take your laptop or your desktop and plug it into the supercomputer and just uh, get an IP address and automatically uh, FTP data around inside the machine. Um, I'm not sure we're gonna let users do that, but you could if you wanted to. So um, one of the things that's really nice about this from a supercomputing center perspective though is it allows us to blur the line between the inside and the outside of the machine. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that um, if we have uh, users running at these experimental facilities at telescopes or at light sources and they wanna be able to um, communicate rapidly and seamlessly with the compute nodes inside of the machine, they're gonna be able to do that very straightforwardly. They can just send a packet from the Ethernet card at the telescope and tag it and it will go all the way through to the compute node seamlessly and back again. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a huge productivity win and a huge uh, benefit for us in terms of scheduling all of these resources, the network and uh, the supercomputer all together in order to enable these uh, experimental data facilities uh, to use the machine seamlessly. It will also allow us to, to uh, mount the storage that's internal to the machine externally to the machine much more easily as well. So uh, on our Cori machine, which is on the floor today, we deployed a bus buffer, which has, um, which has been there for what, three, a little more than three years now. And that is a one and a half petabyte flash file system with one and a half terabytes of, uh, per second of, of performance. And that's been well used by uh, a large number of our users. Um, as you can tell from a one and a half petabyte capacity is not really enough such that we could put every user on it today. Um, one of the good things about uh, deploying a machine next year is that the price of flash keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. And so come next year, this is the specs of the file system that we're gonna be able to put out there. Then it will be a 30 petabyte file system and it will do, uh, actually this number is a little bit old, it will do more than five terabytes a second. Um, and uh, it will be based on Lustre. Uh, so uh, there'll be some familiarity there, but what users will also be able to get is the benefit of the large IOPS rate you can get from a flash file system, as well as the massive bandwidth. To deploy a five terabyte a second spinning disk file system would really just be cost prohibitive in, in this time frame. You'd see so many spindles, it would be ridiculous. So this is a really good thing. Um, if you ask our users what it is that they most want from NERSC, the first thing they say is more CPU cycles. The second thing they say is better I.O., right? Um, and th this is really a game-changing technology in this respect. It will give uh, significantly better bandwidth than what we'd be able to do with, with other technologies. We will also deploy a spinning disk file system 
um, from a, a capacity, uh, in order to meet our capacity needs. So that will be about uh, 200 petabytes and about half a terabyte a second. So one of the questions we uh, got when we first uh, announced the Perlmutter machine was why did you call it Perlmutter? Um, well, we named it after Sol Perlmutter. Sol is a staff scientist at Berkeley Lab. He was the winner of um, the 2011 Nobel Prize. Uh, and he discovered that um, the acceleration of the universe, sorry, the expansion of the acceleration, the expansion of the universe is accelerating, is what he discovered. Um, and he did that by looking at supernovas and then analyzing the results of those uh, observations on um, supercomputers. So given that we're now moving to a, a period of time where we're doing more and more of this experimental analysis on our machines, we thought it was very fitting to name the machine after him. So when the director of our center called him up and said, uh, can we name a supercomputer after you? He said, sure, but I have one uh, one criteria, and that is that you don't make all your users type Perlmutter, so you, you will be able to type SSH sol.nurse.gov in order to log in. <laughs> Oops. So today I've talked about Perlmutter, which is our machine coming next year at NERSC. It will have uh, roughly three to four times the capability of the uh, Cori machine uh, overall. Um, it's the first system we designed from the ground up to really meet the needs of large-scale simulation and data analysis from experimental facilities. Um, we'll have a mixture of nodes, AMD uh, CPU-based nodes and uh, GPU-based nodes. Um, and the choice of how many of each of those we made was really based on an analysis of our workload and our projection of how uh, lightly we thought it was that the community would be able to move to deploy more and more applications on GPUs in the, in the time uh, frame of this machine. It will have a Cray Slingshot network, which is, um, as I mentioned, is really cool, is ethernet based. Uh, it will have an all flash file system. Um, and we will also have a large uh, data software stack on the machine as well, uh, which was for analytics and learning at scale. So uh, thank you for your attention. Um, this is uh, the view from the building at Berkeley Lab. Um, that's the city of San Francisco, just over there in the background. Just behind there is the Golden Gate Bridge. So we by far have the best view of any national lab. <laughs> and uh, we are hiring, and there's the URL there. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>